Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this um, webinar that we will be hosting today. I am so pleased to have you all joining us um, and participating in this event that we have. Um, so for today, we're going to be hearing uh, stories from the states. We have um, five folks who have agreed to share a little bit about what's going on in their states and as well as top priorities. And, um, and then we also hopefully that you all will share the same if we have some time after the questions that you will have for them. My name is Michelle Ekstrom. I'm group director at the National Conference of State Legislatures. And um, I will tell you that I'm having some trouble sharing my screen, my PowerPoint. So I'm just going to leave it as is so that we can all see each other today, which is a little bit more fun anyway. Um, just some reminders for protocols for today. We want to be sure that everyone has their mics muted, um, but there will be times when we ask you to open them up and ask questions and respond um, to us. So just make sure that you know where those controls are. They're at the bottom of your screen. And also, please be sure not to share your um, desktop. And if you do that, I'm going to have to cut you off and not let you share your desktop. Also, be sure to um, write your full name in your tile. As you can see, some of them don't have the full names. And the way you can change that is by going to the three dots up in the top corner of your tile. We just want to make sure that everyone is clearly identified who's on the call. This is for um, security purposes, just to make sure that everyone who's on here should be the folks who are on here. And just so you know, that's why we only send out the links very sparingly and only to a select group. That's why we do not post them on our website. Um, as a reminder, the meeting is being recorded and we have all of the previous meetings recorded and archived and we will be doing the same for the upcoming meetings as well. Um, I am so excited to have today with us five speakers from across the states. We have Rachel Heiss from Maryland. Rachel, do you want to wave or say hello? Uh, we have Julie Pelgren from Colorado. We have uh, Representative Robert Bainey from Indiana. Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos from Washington and Representative Mary Heath from New Hampshire. Um, so before we get started, we thought that we would do some fun trivia. And um, I'm really bummed that the, the slides aren't working and that I can't seem to display them and show my screen um, because we had some pretty um, funny slides built in there. Maybe that's why it's not working for me. <laughs> um, but um, I did want to just do some legislative trivia since it's Friday and we're, we're kind of um, being a little punchy this afternoon. Um, first of all, who, um, and, and there, there are um, prizes, there were prizes that we were going to display for you if you get this. Um, so who can tell me how many state legislators are there across the U.S. and territories? Open up your line and just shout it out. <laughs> Too many. Too many. No one wants to take a guess? 14,179. It's lower by about half. Maybe you have multiples of two in your head today. 7,149. Getting closer. Anybody else want to take one last guess before I reveal it? 7,383. Um, that is a number that is drilled in all of our heads at NCSL. It's like one of the first pieces of trivia you need to know. And just so you know, there's over 30,000 legislative staff. So NCSL has about 40,000, maybe even more members, uh, which is pretty astonishing when you think about it and think of all the work that goes on in the States. And for your effort, everyone was going to get a kitty high five um, for that. But unfortunately, um, I can't show that to you. Um, one more piece of trivia. Um, how many states do you think are in regular or special session right now? Three. 
This is an interesting question because at this time of year, there'd be quite a few. 41. Much lower than that, but higher than three. 10. There's 13. Only 13. So wow. there's um, 10 in what we've termed regular session. And if you're curious about this, we have a whole section on our website under the COVID page on continuity of government and everything that's going into decisions about whether or not a legislature can or should be meeting right now, including all the constitutional provisions around it, as well as what's going into thinking through um, holding session remotely, which is something that Massachusetts is working through. Um, so there's 10 states um, in what they're calling regular session, um, and most of those are year round states and then there are three that are in special session currently and you can find that information as well as the map on our website as well and for that you were going to get a picture of a starbucks gift card um so okay well without further ado we're going to continue in here from um stories from the states i've been having lots of discussions with our counterparts the national governors association the council of few state school officers the National School Boards Association, ECS, and we're all trying to put our heads together around um, what our individual policymakers roles are in all of this. What are their top concerns? How can we be, um, how can we as organizations be coordinating our efforts to help all of you? And we talked about the fact that it's imperative, I think, especially for state legislators, to know what's going on in their states and to talk to their district leaders because that is a place because you all are so close to your constituents where you could be really helpful to inform the discussion at the state level to get those to get a really deep sense of what's going on and to provide feedback about that back up the chain at the state level. Um, so I'm going to pose a question to our five panelists. Um, to get us started. And I, I'm going to go around and ask each one of you to tell us a little bit about the state of education in your state. And what is your number one top priority for right now? Um, we'll be talking a little bit later about what are your um, priorities, you know, in the next six to nine months. But right now, what is your number one top priority? So um, let's start with Representative Heath in New Hampshire. There I am, uh, unmuted. Well, all our schools are currently um, closed and um, they're all on remote session. Um, the districts, some districts are struggling a little bit and planning to end their year earlier, probably at the end of May instead of the middle of June. Um, teachers and students are responding to the online um, pretty well. They're, um, some are very excited about it. I think the hardest thing right now are the traditions and rituals that um, schools go through, particularly at this time of the year. And they're, they're lost to students, especially for seniors. So that, that's kind of hard right now. Another um, issue, actually probably one of the biggest challenges for us is reaching out to uh, disadvantaged um, students and children with disabilities to make sure that they're getting equitable access to education. And, and um, that's a bit of a struggle, but we've got lots of people uh, reaching out and checking on those students. So basically our, our students are doing pretty well. Um, the grading issue I think is a concern. And so, um, I've been talking to um, some different places and, and there are a few thing, different things going on. Some have gone to a, kind of like a pass fail. Others are really giving students um, um, uh, that have to give grades because some school districts are worried the colleges won't accept pass fail. So um, they're giving students additional um, steps that they can take to um, retake a test or retake an assignment because online is such a new way of learning for some students that they're not quite sure about it. So um, there's a lot of that going on. So the options are working well. 
and just um, developing different procedures to reach the, all those students out there that, that may not have the access that they want. And of course, I think one of the really good things that's going on is that we've not ceased uh, providing um, a lunch program uh, for our, our city uh, students who are on free and reduced lunch. And even on the weekends, there are 5,000 meals that are going out just in the city of Manchester alone. So that, and, oh, and I just, I'll talk a little bit about our universities and colleges. Um, they too um, pretty much are all closed down except for some students that um, special dorms have been put together for students that are international students and can't get home. Um, but uh, in terms of classwork, everything is online. And one of our universities, Southern New Hampshire University, has even offered to provide assistance to other colleges and universities, if they, and, and actually K-12 as well, if they want some assistance in, in um, online learning. So that's what's kind of going on in New Hampshire right now. It's, it's um, interesting at best. Sorry, I had myself muted. Um, and what would you say is your number one top priority right now as a state legislator? Um, well, budget concerns um, have to be a top priority. And in New Hampshire, we really worked hard in our, in our last budget to make sure we had increased school funding. We also have a, a funding commission that we're trying to get up and running. So right now, um, with the deficits that we're going to be looking at and revenues coming in at, at such um, a distorted level, um, we're worried about what the funding is going to look like um, over the next few months. But again, it's reaching all kids and making sure um, everybody has equitable access to learning. That's that, I think those are the two big things that we have to be concerned with right now, as well as getting back to work and getting our bills passed and, and doing what we have to do. Representative Baining, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, I would uh, kind of echo my, our, my number one issue in India. I think most uh, people who are focused on education is equity. Um, probably like New Hampshire. Um, number one, uh, our schools have been out since March 19th. Um, the governor has closed them for the rest of the year, so they will not be going back. Um, the governor waived 20 days initially, so um, they basically, some school district did, did absolutely nothing for 20 days at all. Um, some of our schools were prepared for what we call, I would call e-learning or what we call e-learning which is uh, generally a, uh, a day that is a, a instructional day that you, they would normally use for weather related or some sort of uh, sudden closure. So it would be a teacher would pre prepare a single lesson and, send, and that's how the, either they send it home or they would um, digitally make it available to them. Um, none of them in general were prepared for going totally online. Um, the governor um, has required all schools to um, come up with a plan that's been had to be submitted to the Department of Education by the state of April as to how they were going to educate students um, for the rest of the year. They were required to have at least, um, they, if they had not did not have a plan and had not done any virtual uh, learning at this point in time, they had to ensure that from May first forward they had an additional twenty days of uh, uh, e-learning available. Um, the biggest, like I said, the, probably the most, um, our schools, just like Mary, our schools are serving um, lunches all over the state. Um, we're obviously geographically and by population bigger than New Hampshire, but um, so it's a, uh, all our school districts are providing the free lunch. Um, and, and I almost think that um, that has been a, a bigger focus than learning in many respects. Uh, the superintendent um, had a uh, superintendent of public instruction had a webinar for a, a leadership and for our federal legislators last week. She informed us that according to a lot of studies that they've seen, uh, our students could suffer as much as a 50% learning loss in math and 30% in language arts. Um, I had a meeting yesterday with about 20 superintendents who are like, they're getting, they feel like they've gotten no guidance as to 
how to move forward for starting the next school year. What is going to be the new normal? What are we going to do? Is it going to be brick and mortar? Is it going in person? Is it going to be virtual? Are we going to do a blended? Um, you know, it's, it's uh, the superintendent of public instruction believes that we will not be going back next fall. Um, when I had a, a conference call with her last week as well, I told her that honestly, if we're still shelter in place by this time next fall, or by the fall, I don't think school is gonna be a priority anyway because the economy will be such a disaster. We won't have the money to be able to uh, pay anything, pay for anything. So um, somehow we've got to figure out what a new normal is and get the economy back open. Rachel, I'm just going in line of who's on my pictures. Rachel Heights from Maryland. Okay, sorry, I had to figure out how to unmute myself. Um, hi, so very similar to New Hampshire and Indiana, um, schools have been closed since March 13th here. Um, at this point, they are closed until May 15th. Um, they've been sort of staggering, making incremental decisions. Um, and we're not sure what's going to happen after May 15th. And the governor is actually holding a press conference right now. So I've been checking to see what he's saying, but they didn't make any additional announcement about the school years at this point. So they're working on a, a phased way of reopening uh, the economy, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, I think I, I definitely similar to Indiana, our school systems actually probably were not in as good a position as Indiana because for the most part, um, very few of them had any preparedness for e-learning whatsoever. Um, and so uh, very little has been happening in Maryland up to this point um, until probably last week when um, I think classes, classes started to actually meet more uh, during, during the day. Um, An actual instruction was going on. Uh, Similar as Indiana, uh, school systems are submitting continuity of learning plans to the state superintendent um, about how they're going to um, continue the school year online. Um, but um, at this point, about we actually had to survey the superintendents to find out um, how many uh, kids have not had contact with their. Um, there we go. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, okay. Um, so it turns out at this point, and this is sort of anecdotal, I wouldn't say this is hard, hard evidence, uh, data driven, um, about 10% of students around the state, the schools have not made contact with, either online or uh, through picking up uh, packets of materials at the schools. So um, I think one of the big priorities is um, making sure that we're connecting and, and know what's going on with every kid uh, in the schools and um, uh, getting them connected. The school systems have been um, handing out Chrome laptops and MiFi's, um, uh, tons of them, thousands and thousands of them. Um, because again, very few systems were sort of at that one-to-one -one device to student ratio. Um, so it's really, I think, been playing a lot of catch up, although, you know, who would have ever imagined we would be in this uh, situation at this point. Um, so what else? Um, lots of school meals are being given out and actually not just for the students, but also their families. Um, and I agree that really, I think in the first few weeks really was uh, the focus and priority to make sure that kids who rely on those free meals um, are getting them. Um, and uh, top priority, oh, I did wanna say, um, the state superintendent, it, it's still sort of in the works, but there's the possibility that um, they will uh, provide e-learning or distance learning during the summer um, to, to help with the kids who, uh, to, to reduce the loss of learning, uh, which I think would make a lot of sense. Although, as we know, a lot of the kids who might lose the most 
in learning might not have access to a computer or internet or you know a, a, a home situation that is conducive to doing that online but I, it's better than nothing I think um, top priority right now is I think um, getting the remote learning really up and running if, if, if this is the new normal for the rest of the school year um, I think to not to, to try to salvage whatever can be salvaged. And I'll talk more about the budget and Kerwin when, when we do the next round of questions. Julie Pelgrin, do you wanna go next? Sure, happy to. Hi everybody. Well, Colorado sounds like it's pretty much in the same position as most of the other states. Our schools have been closed by executive order since the 18th of March, and it was just extended for the remainder of the school year a couple days ago. Um, <clears throat> it's my sense that all of the districts are trying to you know, provide some level of online learning. It's spotty, I'm guessing. I have not heard much about how it probably going into rural areas, but I'm guessing it's not going much. I read some about two um, schools providing materials that kids can come pick up. And, and I did notice in the executive order, it still allows school buildings to be open for small group instruction, staff professional development, food service, internet, and hardware use, um, picking up materials, special ed, and mental health support. I have not read really how much the school buildings are being used for those things, except for meals, of course. We're, we're distributing a lot of meals as well. They've suspended state testing. They've suspended accreditation for this year. They've suspended teacher evaluations for this year. And of course, no sports, which is probably what has the students the most bummed. Um, they also did suspend the um, teacher pupil contact hour requirements. So, and I think they did that before they knew whether they'd be coming back so that schools didn't feel like they had to continue the school year on into the summer. I've seen a few headlines about, I think they're thinking about summer school, but I, I don't think anyone's thinking seriously about it, certainly nothing in person. And what's gonna happen next year, is, I think is completely up in the air. There hasn't been really any indication at this point as to whether they'll be able to actually meet physically in the fall, but I think it's a lot of people have their doubts. Um, higher ed, like I think everywhere else in the country, we're also closed down. All the schools are close to in-person, um, but and most, I think, have announced that they will be moving to online for uh, spring and summer classes. So I think they're still trying to do a lot online. Number one challenge upon return, our legislators, legislature is hopefully going to return on the 18th of May. <clears throat> Number one challenge will be, first off, we have to pass a budget before the end of the fiscal year, and we have to pass a school finance bill. Um, in Colorado, we have to actually pass a bill every year to fund school finance, not just through the long, not just through our budget bill, but also by, we have to set our base amount of funding in statute every year. So they have to come back and do that. And there's also our, a negative factor that we'll talk about more later. Um, but the biggest challenge obviously is gonna be the fact that in December, we thought we would have $800 million more than we had this year. In March, we thought we'd have $27 million more than we have this year. And now the estimates are that we will have between one and $3 billion less than we had last year. So there's a potential for 10 to 20% cuts. We're gonna get a new forecast on the 12th of May. So we'll see where it goes from there. Representative Santos, how are things going in Washington? Oh, I think you're on mute. There, how about that? Okay, I apologize. It was just a major thing to figure out how to get the video going. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I hate to say this, but I was sitting on another webinar. It, it was the NCSL education webinar, but it's the one for May 1st for a while. So uh, I'm, I apologize as I'm still trying to get accustomed to all, all of this way of doing all things. Which, problems today. <laughs> Yeah, so, but I think that in some ways it's also very reflective 
perspective of um, the challenges that are going on in the field. Uh, I know not just in my state, but all over the place. Um, I think uh, what might be uh, helpful for laying context uh, about what's going on in Washington state is sort of to go through a quick um, context setting. Um, and uh, because I think my, the issues in Washington state are not very dissimilar from what we've already just heard uh, the previous speakers um, note. I think what um, may have been to our benefit to a certain extent is that, uh, of course, up until recently, we thought we were the first state um, to have an actual uh, COVID case and uh, COVID death. Um, and that occurred in February while we were still in legislative session. Um, this is our short legislative year, uh, the 60 day session. So our uh, scheduled signee die was March 12th. Um, uh, this, the, the impact of uh, the news around the pandemic, I think is best illustrated by just give quick, um, uh, side note, um, of course, we heard about this this virus that was going on overseas um, as early as, you know, late last year. Um, and early in our session, we were setting aside um, somewhere in the uh, realm of $10 million um, should uh, we have to deal with COVID. Um, by March 11th, um, the figure had jumped to $50 million. Um, that was early in the day. By the end of the day on March 11th, it had jumped to 100 million. By the day uh, that we were to adjourn signing die, that figure doubled to 200 million. Um, and that's what we passed in the budget because uh, we uh, are not scheduled to come back uh, for a regular session until next January. And so we knew that this virus um, that was already uh, appearing in Washington state was going to have the worst impacts in Washington state while the legislature was not in session. So we wanted to make sure that we gave the governor adequate uh, funding to the extent that we could try and anticipate um, uh, the, the, the cost factor. I will say we've already uh, spent to date 17 million and that's just in the health related um, responses. Uh, just in terms of some other uh, key uh, dates, uh, in Washington State, um, because we were so uh, we were affected so early, um, uh, just again a couple of proclamation dates. The governor had um, uh, prohibited uh, mass gatherings on March 11, um, and he uh, closed uh, the schools in three major counties. That's where the ring of uh, these cases were occurring. So uh, the major Puget Sound metropolitan area of King, Snohomish, and Pierce counties. Uh, he closed them on March 12th, same day as Sine Die. On March 13th, he closed all of the educational uh, facilities statewide. In that proclamation, he indicated that the higher education facilities uh, should uh, continue to, to uh, provide their services online. But um, playing up to one of the unique features of our state, as uh, many of you have heard me say, uh, the governor uh, is the uh, chief executive for general government. Uh, but our superintendent of public instruction is a constitutional executive officer of the state. So the, the governor's proclamation was silent about um, what was uh, to go on in the schools. He was just closing the buildings. So the first uh, couple of weeks in Washington state, um, like so many uh, people across the United States, there was a question of what's going to happen next. I mean, how do you pre prepare for what you don't know um, is to come? And so I think for the first couple of weeks, people were just hunkering down in their homes. That included students, that included uh, clearly families, included uh, educators. Um, but by um, April 6th, I think, uh, the governor um, then, uh, excuse me, not the governor, uh, the um, 
I beg your pardon, I'm getting my dates all mixed up. Early April, let's just call it that. Uh, the uh, superintendent um, then issued guidance uh, to uh, the schools uh, statewide saying, well, the buildings might be closed, but it is my expectation that uh, there be continuous learning. And that was quite uh, challenging. So um, I wanna move now to some of the big issues um, that we're facing as a result of this sort of um, different space where uh, schools are closed for the remainder of this academic year, but the superintendent has indicated that there is an expectation that there be continuous learning going on for each of our students. Um, as many people have said, uh, I think the biggest issue that um, we are facing is the issue of equity. Um, and um, I think, uh, again, to give this a little bit of context, um, uh, we have 295 school districts in the state of Washington. We have 1.1 million students. Um, that's compared to an overall population of about seven and a half million. Um, our square mileage, uh, which of course includes uh, many riverways, many uh, bodies of water, um, many islands, um, is 71,000 uh, square miles. Um, so the issue of equity, I want to divide into a couple of uh, ways. One is number one, um, how do you provide online or e-learning or any type of uh, remote learning if you don't even have basic um, broadband services in your community, let alone in your household. So that's one issue that we're uh, dealing with. The other issue is uh, an issue of how do you provide online uh, learning uh, when um, there is such a uh, big gap between the haves and the have nots in terms of who has computers, who doesn't have a computer. Maybe their, uh, their only way to access um, any type of, um, now I'm gonna use bad words because this, I'm, a, I'm a digital immigrant. So anything on the internet okay, is the way I'm gonna say it. I don't know, um, and so if, you, if your only way to access anything on the internet is by your cell phone as opposed to a computer and being plugged in. Um, uh, so those are some uh, significant issues. The other is um, what, how do we, with so many students now being uh, expected to continuously learn at home, the burden really is falling much more to families, to to the parents uh, in particular, but other members of the family as well. And when you start talking about family members who are one, uh, either um, non-English speaking and may have connection issues to the school to begin with, but now are having to teach their child, um, we, we have a big concern there. Uh, the other is, um, for those uh, parents who may speak English just fine, um, but who are the essential workers um, who have to go in uh, to work and um, are unable to, uh, for those reasons, uh, be able to provide the kind of educational support uh, for their students. Some of our districts um, are doing really, really well in uh, responding to this um, emergency on a variety of levels. Uh, again, in those first two weeks when nobody knew really what was going on, the first deployment, um, as uh, I think Bob mentioned, was food. Our concern for making sure that our, our kids were fed and um, by extension, many of their families as well. And so whether that was, um, deploying the school buses or making other kinds of arrangements, that first order of human need was um, where we were going. Um, where we are today now is really interesting because uh, in trying to uh, address continuous learning, um, many schools who have not previously already provided their student with a Chromebook or whatever computer um, 
hardware uh, and software they're using uh, are now frantically trying to uh, get those out to their students. And I think it's really interesting sort of, again, I talked about the digital divide. This is where I think our assumptions really have to be um, uh, examined. Uh, because in fact, um, uh, there was a story in the Seattle Times just a couple of days ago. Um, the largest school district in the state, the home of Amazon, Microsoft, well, I guess Microsoft is technically across the lake, but um, you get the picture. Um, all of these high-tech giants. Um, our school district, uh, as of two days ago, um, with I think we have something like 56,000 students in, this, in the school district, distributed 2,000 uh, laptops. By comparison, some of the smaller and medium um, school districts that surround Seattle have distributed 20,000 uh, and upward uh, of these books. And so, um, though I think we have to, one of the things that I'm worried about is that sometimes we make assumptions um, that then contribute to um, uh, reinforcing some of the gaps that already exist. And so I'm going to end by saying um, one more thing, because I think Michelle wants to ask us other questions. Um, and that is, in my conversations with different groups, whether it's uh, my uh, fellow legislators here in Washington State, um, or if it's with um, some of the parents, whether they be special needs parents, not the parents of special needs students, um, or uh, some of the community groups that represent uh, lang uh, language limited uh, families and communities. Um, one of the things that uh, we are quickly uh, gelling around is the notion that uh, while we have always known that the existing system of education um, had huge gaps for certain uh, types of students, because those were not the types of students that were expected to be educated in the 19th century, um, this uh, pandemic has um, uh, thrown wide open the door around any veneer that we have uh, manage to somehow bridge those gaps. And so uh, as we move forward, there's an interesting um, uh, sentiment that's beginning to spread that in um, whatever we do moving forward, because I agree, I think school's gonna look very, very different next year, um, that whatever we do moving forward, we will have to start by looking at equity first. And um, those of you who were on the on Sunny's commission will smile because we're talking about utilizing the principles of universal design first in order to be able to ensure that uh, when we come out on the other side of this uh, pandemic with respect to our school system, that uh, equity will actually be uh, not something that we strive for, but it is something that is actually present. Thank you. That was that was really, really helpful. And actually, it really tees up my next question and my final question. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. So in that time, I would just like you to um, think about what are going to be your priorities in the next six to nine months. Um, a number of the policy organizations are thinking of this in terms of, you know, restarting, rebuilding, recovery, um, all those things that you all have, have talked about. What what will this mean for you in the next six to nine months? And what does that mean uniquely for your state, given in terms of some of the things that you already were prioritizing? So what will be your priorities in six to nine months and how will that impact the things that you've been working so hard on? So Representative Heath, let's again start with you. Well, I wish I could get out my crystal ball <laughs> because I, I think we all don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, um, it's our schools are closed uh, for the rest of the year. But um, I think what we need to consider, um, I think we, again, equity is an issue, but I think we have to realize that not only are we dealing with this crisis, but homelessness, unemployment, um, 
We still have an opioid crisis going on in my state. There are a lot of issues that families are dealing with. So I think somehow, some way, we have to um, stand back and look at the emotional issues and the anxiety that families and students are under. Um, and then to figure out how to assess the learning that's been going on and to kind of restart. Um, we don't know if schools are gonna start in September. We, we don't think there's going to be any kind of summer schools going on. Um, so there are so, so, just so many issues that don't have any answers right now. So over the six, next six months or so, um, of which we have a big election coming up during that time as well. So I think that, that in terms of school, um, it won't look the same. And I think we're gonna have to have more online learning going on. And, and fortunately, teachers are, are grappling with that and, and for the most part seem to be doing okay. And the commissioner is helping out with that, providing a lot of resources and links. But, um, and then the financial, because right now we don't know what we're gonna be dealing with in terms of, of what, we're, what kind of funding we're gonna have available to support our schools. And I know we have some um, funding packages that are coming through. But you know, with the deficits that we're seeing, I don't know what that's going to show. So you know what? I just think we have to keep our kids in mind and do as much as we can to, to provide some kind of um, stability all the way around as much as we can. Representative Beening. Um, I would say, first off, um, I don't know if Indiana is unique, but um, our governor to, right now has sweeping authority. He can do anything he wants. He can issue an executive order uh, and do just, I mean, the legislature was out. Uh, we got out, I think, March 10th or 11th. So we, um, this was on a budget year. We went into uh, this year with uh, a, about a $3 billion surplus in a rainy day. We, uh, as of uh, March, as of February, we were $100 million over forecast. Um, March revenue came in $70 million under forecast. So we're $30 million as of March um, in, above our forecast, but we are expecting to burn through all of our $3 billion surplus um, probably by uh, sometime this fall. Uh, especially if things don't uh, turn up. And our schools are funded, 100% of the general fund obligations come from state. We are not like most states or many states where property tax revenue, property tax only goes to fund uh, debt service, capital projects and transportation. So it's all in the back of the state. Um, we have had uh, a lot of, we're having discussions in regards to the CARES Act distribution specifically about the governor's um, component of that. The, our governor has a, about $61 million of discretionary income or discretionary money from the CARES Act. We are very concerned about equity and being a state that has a lot of rural pockets, just like Colorado, Washington, we have a lot of places um, where we know we don't have connectivity outside of a cell phone. Um, we know that we don't have devices, so we're in the process of doing a survey. We fortunately, under uh, some of the last uh, a couple of federal acts, um, the uh, feds are giving families an, a special allocation. Um, if they are on free and reduced lunch, they will get approximately $300 per student in additional money uh, that will flow through our Family Social Service Administration. So we're going to be able to identify individual households and addresses now, which will give us a better um, ability to go after and determine exactly uh, where they are in terms of connectivity, et cetera. Um, learning loss is also a big problem that we've had discussions. And then um, flexibility. Uh, our schools, when I met with superintendents yesterday, because we have a 180 uh, day school requirement, one of the suggestions was in able to meet the social distancing requirements that they would only do school for um, elementary school, for instance, for half the uh, school would go on Monday, Wednesday, the other half, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday would be a remediation or enrichment day. Well, they won't meet their 180 day requirements. So how, do, how are we gonna be able to meet that? Um, we also have, I, I think regardless of what happens, um, 
there are going to be a lot of parents who are going to say, even if, you know, tomorrow we would find a um, vaccine, they're not going to send their kids back to an in-school, uh, in-person school. They're going to want to continue to shelter their students. So do we continue to, do each one of our schools offer an, you know, in-person program as well as a virtual program? It doesn't make practical sense. And I think because of the quality, you're, so we're looking at how can we leverage some of our virtual programs that we, your virtual charters, et cetera, that actually have some fairly solid curriculum and training for teachers, as well as they've got a lot of guidelines to make sure that students are engaged. Um, and last I'll end about um, is equity. When it comes, even when it comes down to equity today, equity isn't just about money. Um, I uh, have a nephew who, who teaches in one of the state's second most affluent county. And he has 75 students in his uh, high school class. They were the first school to close. They closed before the governor required him to be closed because they had the first case of COVID. Um, out of that 75 kids, only 29 of them have uh, gotten online and actually done any of their homework. And so equity isn't just about having the equipment, but it's about making sure they're engaged. I said the last thing, the last thing I will say is that there's a lot of parents who are saying, I'm over this, I can't handle, I, I can't work at home and be responsible for uh, teaching my kids. So will the new normal be only focusing on reading, writing, arithmetic, as opposed to all the other things, because parents are saying, I can't deal with all of this. So those are the issues that are confronting us in Indiana. Rachel, and I will say we have about 10 minutes left, so we're going to have to ask each of you to keep your comments to about three minutes. Uh, sure, I will be brief. So in Maryland, the unique thing, um, I could echo everything that's been said, but I think the unique thing is that in the epitome of bad timing, this was the session that the legislature um, worked on uh, transformational uh, legislation for our K-12 system based on the international study groups work and the um, the five, uh, the nine building blocks, we have them in five policy areas, but um, to improve our P-12 um, education system. That bill, it's now, it's called the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. It passed about two days before the legislature adjourned early for Sunny Die about three weeks early. Um, and um, it was an interesting session to say the least. But um, uh, one of the last minute amendments to the bill was a uh, revenue bec uh, trigger if uh, the uh, revenues dropped by more than um, seven and a half percent, then the, uh, the bill would uh, be delayed implementation. And that equates to about $1.4 billion of revenues in Maryland. Um, and our latest estimate, if the um, shutdown kind of remains through the end of the fiscal year, June 30th is $2.8 billion loss of revenues. So um, at this point, it uh, the, the bill has gone to the governor along with all the other bills that they passed in the last few days of session. Um, and we're waiting to see what the governor does with the bill. Um, he um, is unlikely to actually sign it, but whether he actually vetoes it or lets it go into law without signing it is, is the big question. Um, the legislature had talked about coming back in May for a special session, but they just earlier this week said that they were not going to do that because of concerns of it wouldn't be uh, safe. And so uh, we really don't know what, what's going to happen with that. Um, but at this point, I think what a lot of people to echo the equity uh, statements and challenges, um, I think that this whole situation has just exposed the weaknesses of our education system and the fact that we really do need to do things differently. And um, while we may not be able to afford to, to do some of the really major things that 
Marilyn was hoping to do in the next few years, we, we clearly need to um, change, uh, change what we're doing and focus on those things that we can do um, that cost less money. Julie Pelgrin. Sorry, I should have already been unmuted. Um, all of the above, so we'll start with the yes and. <laughs> I think we have all of those kinds of policy challenges that are gonna be facing us. I'm afraid in Colorado, however, as usual, it's going to come down to money and nothing but money because we're already, some would say Colorado already funds their education at an extremely low level as compared to other states. Um, so in Colorado, we already have, we have constitutional requirements with regard to our base funding, which in the, in the last economic turn down, or downturn resulted in not being able to really meet if, if your base has to increase by inflation and then it goes through the formula, then it results in a certain amount per kid that the state has to pay its share of. And in the last downturn, we were unable to make that, that payment. So we came up with a very creative um, factor in our formula called, at that point, the negative factor. We now call it the budget stabilization factor. Um, we have been over the years since the last recession working very hard at whittling it down. Um, the ability to even maintain where it is right now is going to be, <clears throat> I don't know that we'll be able to maintain that. The other thing about Colorado is we're a very strong local control state. And so most, a lot of what goes on in our districts is controlled by the districts. When we want to get districts to do things, we, we take the tack that the federal government takes and we pay them for it. So we have many grant programs that are trying to drive initiatives like um, teacher recruitment and retention, is driving initiatives like early grade literacy, the kinds of things that you really want to, the state wants to focus on and get the districts to really focus on. We have to pay for those separately. But now with this downturn, the big push that we're gonna get from the districts to maintain um, to not increase the negative factor, to try to just give them the regular school funding at the highest level we possibly can means we're going to be pulling money out of grant programs. So the General Assembly has less leverage potentially around policy issues for the next couple of years because all the money's going to need to go into school finance. Um, and finally, we've been trying to push for the last, well, several years, and we were actually maybe possibly making progress this year on trying to reestablish the uh, mill levies within our state due to a confluence of constitutional provisions that we don't have time to talk about now. Our states now, the amount that's paid as the local share ranges from a mill levy of 1.6 to mill levies of 27. And there's really no rhyme nor reason as to who pays what. It's been, like I said, it's been a process over many years. So <clears throat> we have members who have been working on coming out with a process to reset those. And in Colorado, to reset those, it requires arguably um, voter approval to, to increase taxes. And so this has already been, it was a big fight already. It was already questionable as to whether we were going, they, the General Assembly was going to be able to do anything about it. It's probably even more questionable now, but to the extent the districts want to reduce that negative factor, the only way that's going to happen is if the districts start paying more on the district side. So we're kind of in a box, and I'm afraid that this whole situation is going to keep us tightly in that box for a while longer, a long while longer. So that's the positive note from Colorado. <laughs> And we have about two minutes left, so let's end with Representative Santos. You are on mute again. I'm gonna unmute you. I can't, I can't. Hello? Yeah. I'm so sorry. You could see that I was talking. Um, <laughs> 
I'm going to uh, just uh, very quickly hop around some of, I think, the key issues that will occupy uh, legislators who are engaged in education policy over the next, not only six to nine months, but actually um, probably a little bit longer as well. And they have some great implications. Uh, it's sort of uh, jumping on Bob's bandwagon. Um, you know, if, if school is going to continue to take place at home, uh, will we continue to need um, 24 credits to graduate? That's the basic state requirement uh, in this state. Or are we going to start slimming it down um, to uh, fewer numbers of um, credits to graduate? It's the question of what is a graduate of a Washington State High School? Um, it raises questions around what is a credit. Uh, it raises questions around uh, grades. Um, and what that looks like, particularly since this year the uh, superintendent has come out with a guidance that tells all the districts uh, from now until the end of the year, uh, either um, give your uh, students um, uh, passing grades um, or, uh, and nobody can have a grade that's lower than what they were when this all went down. Uh, in Seattle, it resulted in everybody getting an A, um, just period, um, blanket. Um, I think though, to me, what the most uh, important issue that I will leave uh, you all with, which is the sort of the unique thing about Washington State is, uh, as you know, uh, we have in our state constitution a paramount duty to provide for education. And because we also will be struggling with all the revenue issues that my um, colleagues have talked about, I think that sets us up for a very interesting battle in the upcoming legislative session. Do you give people food? Do you give people public health? Or do you educate them in accordance with our constitutional duty? Um, I, I think we're going to have to do both, uh, which means that the way we've done education is going to have um, with respect uh, to the other piece that's unique about uh, Washington State's paramount duty, as you will all rec uh, recall that a few years ago we were uh, going through the McCleary decision, which is the full funding decision. In that, um, our, our state Supreme Court ordered some important uh, principles uh, that will also play into that question of uh, who's on first, what's the priority, and that is uh, the legislature is prohibited making cuts to education for purely fiscal reasons. So I, I don't know what to do with that, but we'll figure that out, I guess, in January. There's no doubt about the fact that there is some difficult decisions ahead for all of you. And I just want to reiterate how we are here for you to help you, whether it be research on what we know is most impactful for student outcomes, whether it's digging into issues like learning loss or digital learning, um, or keeping you up to date on what's going on with state budgets, we are happy to help. So just want to um, make sure that you know that and make sure that you reach out to us with those needs. Um, next week, we will continue with our virtual meeting series. We will have a discussion on Tuesday about serving students with disabilities during this time and we will have with us an expert from an organization who um, focuses on serving students with disabilities and what we know about the importance of that in the first place and what we know about best practices and what that looks like right now and where are some of the the places where we're um, struggling and also some guidance. We've, we've come across a document from MIT where they put together lots of different things from all 50 states. And so there's a chart on 50 state guidance or at least a column in this piece on 50 state guidance for, uh, for students with disabilities. And then on Friday, we will have another updated discussion about budgets. Um, we hope to have Erica McKellar with us on Friday. She is NCSL's expert on the general topic of state budget. So she's the one who's been in touch with all the legislative budget officers, trying to figure out what your budget forecasts are. As you can imagine, we're getting a ton of questions about this. And I will say we, I heard um, that the US Department of Education is thinking there's only gonna be a couple of states this year that won't, will struggle to meet the maintenance of the effort. 
requirement <laughs> and we'll need waivers and and we're all saying we got to gather information very quickly and show uh, show them that it's all 50 states that are going to be struggling in this space and um you know that's that that's just not um, realistic thinking at this point so it will be important for us to get that information to you and we will be <laughs> be be arguing on your behalf and working with our policy partners also to make sure that that information is um is is really in front of the folks who are making decisions right now about the federal funding that is going to come down um, so please join us i will send out a reminder again on monday i think the reminder went better yesterday um, our distribution list has grown pretty big and so we are now breaking it up into like eight different emails that are going out to eight different groups and i think that really helped to make sure that it wasn't getting caught in people's um, spam spam catcher or your security software so hopefully that made a difference this time um, thank you very much and we will look forward to um, being with all of you again on Tuesday for Tuesday's virtual meeting at 3 p.m. Eastern time have a good weekend